Hey everybody, welcome back to the Plays and Fades YouTube channel. I'm your host, Gordo Gambles. Welcome back to their full card breakdown. This time for UFC Vegas 81, we do ourselves 12 fights from the UFC Apex, and I'm excited to break it down, as always, from both a, from both a betting and DraftKings perspective. That kind of sums up how last week went. Let's cr briefly talk about a couple things here. First of all, tough one last week. Interesting decisions, interesting game plans, and just overall not my best card but you know that's fine we, we've been on a decent bit of a roll we're able to move forward we're able to try to bounce back and that also comes with the fact that we are now done Dana White contender series so uh we now have more time to put towards these fights these are now the highlight of the week I did enjoy those fights on Tuesday and we ended up being pretty profitable on them but the sole focus is now on Saturday starting with this card here and then next week with what was a wild week so far I mean I'm filming this Wednesday afternoon Chamaya versus Usman was just announced you saw it as no longer a thing. I don't really know what's happening right now, but there's a lot happening and there's no better time to hit the like button down below, subscribe to the channel. Videos will be continuing weekly, not only a full DraftKings betting breakdown, but best bets video also dropping throughout the week. So show some love here because we had a lot of stuff coming up. Without further ado, we do have 12 fights to talk about, so let's get to it. It should all be timestamped down below, so you don't want to hear me rambling. Skip to your favorite fight. I don't care. Just show some love and let's do this. We get the card started with the 8 and 8. 8 and 8. Ashley Yoder versus the 12 and 8 Emily Ducote. Woo! The battle of records were a thing. This would not be the prettiest one, that's for sure. But we do have Ashley Yoder making her return. It's been a couple of years off, and she's not had the prettiest run in the UFC. Two and six, three and seven, one and four in her last five. I mean, although she does have a cool nickname of Spider Monkey, she hasn't necessarily had the best success here in the UFC. She's got an incredible frame. She's got a good ability to go out there and put some decent combinations together and a decent ground game, but without much physicality, without much of ability to get it to the ground, and without much volume or power on the feet, really. She's pretty much dependent on being the larger fighter or getting it to the ground where she's able to get that submission. In her three wins, she's able to score eight minutes of control time, 13 and three minutes of control time. That seems to be a big path here, and that's probably what she's gonna have to do in this spot here as well. Emily Dakota, the other side of things, she's had one and two run in the UFC so far, but better level of competition, right? Lupe Godinez is someone I rate very highly. Angela Hill, not the best look, but still a, a veteran of the sport, someone who has done very well in her own right. She seems to be the A-side in this match, and this line kind of reflects that. Dakota has multiple ways to get it done. She's going to have way more volume on the feet, I think is the better wrestler, more physical fighter of the two, and has a better career trajectory. At this point of her career, when Yoder has taken a couple of years off, she's getting older, and we don't really know what she brings to the cage, I, I do think Dakota's not only going to be the more active fighter here, but the hungrier one, the one who's going to be able to win those minutes, win the striking exchanges, have the ability to mix in takedowns if she wants as well, although I don't think she needs to here. With that being said, we do have a massive favorite. And although Ducote has all the skills to get it done, I do think she's a more talented fighter. WMMA has variants. Um, there's not necessarily the one I want to trust, especially after Murata last weekend. This isn't a fight I want too much involvement in from a betting perspective. With that being said, though, DraftKings, same thing. 9.3K on DraftKings for Emily Ducote, not someone I want. In her one win, she only scored 76 points. When you're at 9.3 above Chares with Lisboa and McKinney, there are a ton of better options in this card, and I'm not getting to Ducote very often. Even Yoder and Overright in her win, she has gone out there and she's only scored 90 points, 102.65. I guess those aren't bad numbers, but I don't see her winning this fight at a high clip. And she doesn't have much finish equity in her own right. This isn't a fight I want too much on DraftKings. So overall, a, a weird matchup here. Someone who I honestly thought was retired coming back after a couple of years, taking on a, let's say, a more outed prospect here in Dakota who has more get pats to get it done. I do think Dakota wins. However, the line is probably about right. Don't want too much involvement on this one. Let's move on to the next. Speaking of wide lines, I mean, the 19-4-2 Chris Gutierrez versus the 16-8-2 Alatang Haley. And first of all, man, Haley will always be remembered to me as the guy who just got his ribs blown up by Casey Kenny. That's just the one fight I remember the most. By the way, where is Casey Kenny? Who knows? But Haley showed not only good resiliency in that one, but man, his ribs were literally purple. And that just that, that fight's just, for some reason, one I remember way more than I should, considering the, the level of competition there. But coming in here, kind of a short notice about, I mean, Gutierrez was supposed to fight Jackson last week. Haley was supposed to fight uh, Ronnie Yaya here. Instead of take on each other, very uh, different stylistic matchup, but one where we do have a very large favorite here in Chris Gutierrez. I kind of get that, right? Like, I think that if we have to go and pick the, a fighter to win, gun to my head, it's going to be Chris Gutierrez here. He has the better speed. He has the better technicality and strikes, good ability to keep people at range, good movement, very, very good movement, good kicks. But as much as I'd say, yeah, I'd probably take Gutierrez in a 50-50 fight, at the way the line is here, I will probably be betting Alatang Haley. Haley, in his own right, is a pretty good boxer. A ton of power. He he dropped uh, and Heliger in his last matchup there. Knocked out Kevin Kroom very early on in their matchup there. And he's shown not only a good ability to go out there and, and land strikes on the feet, but have better volume. Have the ability to mix and take down late in rounds. And have the ability to go out there and seal the deal in these fights. Chris Gutierrez, although he has those leg kicks, the movement, and the, the better technicality on the feet, is so low volume. And that's why I picked Pedro Munoz against him. That's why I was going to pick Montel Jackson against him as well. Gutierrez's style isn't something I like to back long term. And although he should win this fight from a 
technicality standpoint, he can be out volume. He doesn't have any wrestling. And although his takedown defense is there, he doesn't have any pass. He's a one-dimensional thing. If there's a fighter in front of him who won't really be too aggressive, he can outpoint him. So yeah, he can go out there and score a very close decision like he's done in a lot of his fights, but that's not going to live off the price tag. At plus 300, plus 250, Alatang Haley is going to be a dog who's going to be in his face, very competent in the boxing exchanges, has the ability to mix it up in the takedowns as well, and has shown decent durability to go out there and contend for long periods of time. So I'm leading the dog here. I mean, Alatang Haley, very, very live from a judge's decision kind of things. And when we look at that one-dimensional ability of El Guapo here, although he's very technically sound, although he's got that good footwork, can't trust him at this price tag to go out there and win a dominant decision. DraftKings wise, pretty simple. Gutierrez, 9K, no thank you. I mean, aside from that early knockout of uh, Edgar Morales there, in his decisions, he scored 74, 75, 64, 58. Horrible scores, and at 9K, when I've already mentioned the big names in this range, like Yusef, like Charez, like McKinney, he's not someone I wanna go out there and get at a high clip. He's not someone I can go out there and see finishing too often. He's not gonna be a core play of mine. In GPP, large portfolio, sure, because I guess he could have some contrarian play considering that people won't like his box score too much, but I'd much prefer the, the dog in this matchup as well. 7.2K, Alateng Haley, although he himself doesn't score the best in his decision wins either. At 7.2K, if you're looking for dogs, he's someone who I think is live to win this fight. I kind of wish he was a little cheaper considering the way the line is now, but I do think Haley is more live than line entails. I do think he has a grappling path to victory if he decides to go to it. And I do think that his boxing heavy and pressure heavy approach could allow him to steal this fight here, making him a very plausible option at 7.2k moving on we have the five and one arena alex Seva versus the five and oh melissa dixon and what like yeah what a fight but not like as in like what a fight it's like a what a fight like, you know like it's like how do i even break this down you know do the tape on these one alex Seva is just not the prettiest fighter i and okay i don't mean it that way sure haircut might not be for me i meant more so like optics wise oh not at oh, i'm digging myself a hole here i meant more so striking optic wise because you go out there you watch her fight and rush around sure she has some good grappling some good judo but her striking man although she's throwing with bad intents is not pretty to watch she can be countered she can be hit she's kind of slower to the punch no really jab she's just also power hooks to close a distance and although it's won her fights low level eventually She's going to get caught. She's going to be out of volume. And someone with good footwork is going to take real advantage of that. Is Dixon that girl? Maybe all not too much, but Dixon is someone who is very physical in her own right. Good takedowns, better technical striking, but her defense is not there at all. Has fought a level of competition. And it really comes down to a matchup of two girls who are decent offensively, but with no regard for their own mental health, no regard for their sanity. Very, very big lack of defense from both sides. Alex Seva, because uh, she's so comfortable on the mat, can be taken down, can be hit as well at, at will. And Dixon, someone who I think is better technically on the feet, who, who can be hit in her own right, who hasn't really been tested on the mat. On the mat, though, shall it go there? And I do think it goes there. It's a battle between the wrestling of Dixon and the jiu-jitsu of Alex Seva. Alex Seva went out there, pulled off a knee bar against Edgar last time out. Huge upset. Ugh, we won't even mention that one too much, but... Uh, aside from that, she has shown that she fades down the stretch. She can be hit. She can be controlled. And she's not someone I want to back at a high clip. For that reason, I'm kind of leaning towards Dixon here. Uh, again, very ugly. Alex Eva could catch her with something on the feet, could sub her with something. But the person with more minute winning equity, in my opinion, is Dixon. She'll have the takedown upside, cleaner striker of the two. And I think is strong enough to stay on top of this matchup, be able to even land some potential ground and pound here. I actually don't even mind the under. It was plus money. I think it's plus 110 fight is in the distance now. I don't mind that considering Alex Seva's fighting style is killer to be killed. And Dixon hasn't won the best level of competition, has seemed to be a finisher as well in her own right. Either way, I do see these this being a really low level women's MMA scrap. And for that reason, I don't really want to pick a side with too much conviction, but I'll play some from DraftKings. The problem with DraftKings, although I said it's a really close fight, I'm edging towards Dixon. One of them is 8.6, one of them is 7.6. And I just mentioned Alex Seva's path to victory is probably a knockout on the feet or a knee bar or a submission catching her or something. So that makes her really appealing at 7.6. She scored 97 in her debut against Egger. And I do think Dixon is a much lower level of competition here. Very tempting underdog 7.6. Her path to victory scores so well, but Dixon's also a very good contrarian play. 8.6, no one knows her too well, but her path to victory is usually rooted in takedowns, ground a pound, and finish upside. And I do think she's gonna have the ability to win this fight more often than her counterpart here. Bit of a contrarian play considering the higher price tag, but. Sneaky fight target on DraftKings. I'm leaning towards Dixon, but give me the under from a betting perspective. Speaking of unders, 14 to six, Terrence McKinney, eight and one, Brandon Marat. I don't even, I don't know how you pronounce it, honestly. Marode? I'm going to go with the French version of Marat. He's not French. I just, that's what I decided with here. Uh, I'm Terrence McKinney, man. Whenever you break down his fights, 
And it's honestly fun that he's on the same card as Lacerda because they're the same fighter, really. Guys who would be complete world champions if fights were five minutes. Incredible technicality, incredible skill, great power, great athleticism, great grappling and wrestling to go with it. He is a very terrific fighter until his cardio fails. Because he's being so dynamic, he's going out there, his cardios are losing him that second round. And if he can't get that first round finish, he fades on the stretch. And that's really what we have in this matchup. Skill for skill, I think Terrence McKinney is levels above a Brendan Murrow. The line reflects that. People think he's going to be someone to, to, to back here. And I, I do think McKinney wins this fight. But let's not go out there parlaying McKinney, right? Like if this fight gets after the first round, live at my hut. We've never seen a reason for McKinney to go out there and win rounds or win minutes. And he, his cardio and his high pace style leaves it to be that this guy can be broken. He's not someone you want to back at a high clip. And it is very dangerous to do so. With that being said, his chin's not perfect either. But he does have the much better skills. And he's be quicker to the punch here. I think he's going to have the much better grappling game. I think he's going to wrestling go down there, get there. And I do think he goes out there and gets an early finish. With that being said, though, Brandon does have a good training camp. He's going to be a very competent boxer on the feet as well. And we've seen McKinney starch before. With that being said, he's being starched at this high level of competition. I don't think Matt Hutt is that. And for that reason, I think it's every time McKinney goes out there, faces a low level of competition, he gets a highlight reel. I kind of think this is one here. Betting perspective, hard to trust the, trust the money line of McKinney, but drafting wise, we can take him. 9.5K, terrific drafting score because he's so killer to be killed. Scored 102, 104, 96, and 126 in his four wins of the UFC, all of which are first round finishes. And I do think he's able to get one here, especially if he utilizes that grappling, making him a very good GBP play. The reason he's GBP though is because if this fight makes it out of round one, his ceiling's capped, right? Every fight that he's had in the UFC has made out of round one. Round two sub, round two KO loss. And even around one KO loss against Dover, he's putting up 23 to 10 points there. Not going to be good for you at 9.5K. So you're you're banking on that first round finish. You're paying out to get in. I do think he gets it, but a lot of risk coming the other way. I guess for that reason, Brandon's kind of live at 6.7 because his path to victory, second, third round finish could score pretty well, but I don't expect to do that high of a clip. I do think there is some improving that Brandon has to do here to have some success. And I do think the grappling and wrestling is going to be too much from McKinney over here to allow him to, to get his feet under him here. So give me McKinney. I have him going out here and adding to the highlight reel. It's using that wrestling, using that grappling and getting him out of here early. When he gets that step down in competition, he usually does well. And I do think this is a step down for him. We keep it moving. Six and two, Tynera Lisboa, seven, one and one, Ravena Oliveira. This is a fun one. Uh, genuinely, it's a fun one. It's a sloppy one, but I, I was pretty high on Lisboa in her debut. Uh, took her as an underdog there. She went out there, looked really good, right? She's got Muay Thai background with some very good striking shots behind her. She has won a lot of these wins by submission as well, showing she's improving her ground game. She has good physicality. I think she's a decently well-rounded fighter. She's a finisher by trade. Three wins by sub, three wins by knockout. You like to see that. And she does have a pretty well-rounded skill set. Straight shots down the middle, a lot of power behind them, good physicality. And yes, she's not perfect. I mean, there's a long way for her to go. Low level of competition. We'll have to see when she fights adversity, but she is someone I want to back at a high clip. Flip side of things, her opponent is also a finisher. Seven wins, six of them by KO, one of them by submission. Oliveira seems like someone who's pretty fun as well. She's got a, a good ability to go out there, use her physicality. Good power on the feet, throwing with fighting intention, good ground and pound as well. I mean, she's fun. And yes, this fight is coming together on short notice, and I kind of think it's going to play into it here because I, I do think that the full camp and all this stuff, it could be a, a very, very close fight considering both these girls are very dangerous but unproven. But in this matchup here, we do have two girls who rely on their physicality and rely on their ability to bully their opponents. The difference is one of them is a true 135-er, and the other one, being Oliveira in this and short notice here, usually fights at 25. Like a cardio to do it. I mean, she won in round three last time, but that was at 125. A few fights before that, fighting at 125 as well. She is going to be the smaller of the two here, and I do think that her lack of physicality in this one could go out there and cost her. Because in these matchups where she is able to go out there and bully her opponents, great success. But without doing that here against Lisboa, someone who is going to have the ability to, to mix it up within the clinch, who is going to be the cleaner striker of the two, I do have to side with Lisboa. She's going to be quicker to the punch, straighter shots down the middle, just as much power. I do think she has that physicality to win the clinch, win the ground game as well. I think it's a close fight though. And for that reason, although I'm saying I'm picking Lisboa, she's that physicality, Minus 300, I don't know if I want to go out there and parlay her or back her either. And at 9.4K, that's when the question comes in here. Because she is someone who I think has a ton of finishing upside. All wins by finish, 9.4K, that kind of bodes well. But considering I say this fight is close in the line and tails, and I, I don't think Oliveira is that bad, she can be able to go out there and outscore McKinney, Chares, Yusuf, and a bunch of other fights we haven't talked about so far. I'm not too sure. And for that reason, I'm very tentative to play her at this price range. A very good GBP though. And I do think she is safe in the McKinney. So there is some viability to her. I'm just trying to be cautious to her because she is someone who is still green. I don't think Oliveira is all that bad. And I do think this line is kind of wide. With that being said, give me Lisboa, give me her physicality, give me her straighter shots in the middle. And I do think she wins this fight. Should be a fun one though. And then the prelim headline really 27 and 11, Darren the Damage Elkins versus the 17 and 10 TJ Brown. 
tough one to call for me. I, I've been going back and forth on this one all week, especially when it comes to giving a prediction here, just because of the way these styles go against each other. I, I think if we look at the anthropomorphic advantages and the tail of the tape, as, as my good buddy Liam likes to say, who says it way better than I do. TJ Brown looks to have that advantage, right? Younger fighter, looks to have more athleticism at this point of his career, more pop in his punches, the ability to have decent cardio here, but but what he's going up against here is just a dog. A, a guy in Darren Elkins who doesn't care how bloody he is will continue to go forward and try to push a good pace. He's shown that he's still got it. I mean, he went out there and had a horrible stylistic matchup against Pierce, but went to decision. And then he went out there and the fight before that, scored 117 points in a decision against Connolly. And Elkins is the guy who's just gonna look to go out there and overwhelm you, right? Everywhere from getting these third round comfort behind victories to going to decision with Volkanovski, right? The guy can do it all. And although he's getting this tail end of his career, he is not someone you wanna overlook. I think the problem I have here though is kind of that age and that regression. And I think that in his prime Elkins, I would take him all day, right? He's a style to go out there and wear on TJ Brown's gas tank, really make him work like Algio did. Constant takedowns, taking down like Nerd and Becky did as well. Really just try to pressure the guy, try to break him down the stretch and have a higher work rate. And I do think that Darren Elkins may be able to do that here. The problem is at this point of his career with all that scar tissue being able to be cut up, with that lack of athleticism that you'd want to see from someone who is trying to be such a workhorse, it's hard for me to trust him. And uh, albeit we are getting dog odds to do it, so maybe I'll be able to do so. I don't know if I can get there in the betting window. Uh, it's really, truly a very, very close fight. But that being said, in these close fights, let's do it. Let's take the underdog. And although I might not get there in the betting window, DraftKings Y 7.4K, Darren Elkins is a very live target this week. He's got such a takedown heavy approach. He scores well in his wins, scored 117, 121, 124, and 93 in his last four wins inside the octagon. With so much aggression, takedown upside, and ability to go out there and try to break his opponent, at 7.4K, he's got a very, very high ceiling for underdog. And he's someone I might want to back here especially in tournaments considering that high ceiling. With that being said though, nowhere near a lock. TJ Brown is not a pushover. He himself got decent cardio and although Alger was able to break him, uh, it's not gonna be too easy for Darren Elkins to break him. I think he might be able to, but very, very close fight nonetheless. I guess, give me Elkins. to pick a good underdog here, but no, not too much confidence. Could go either way. Should be a fun one though. On to the main card, 9-1 Christian Rodriguez, 9-0 Cameron Simon. Wow, what a fight. Um, Rodriguez goes out there, spoils, roasts his dreams. And then it's now a, a slight favorite, actually, a moderate size favorite over the, the hyped up prospect in Cameron Simon. Simon's someone who everyone's loved. Um, fun guy to watch, but I haven't been the highest on him. And if that tells you anything, is I bet Obi-Wan Shinobi the pillow Coslo against Simon. Bad bet looking back on it, but I do think Simon has flaws. The question is, is Rodriguez the type of guy to take advantage of it? I'm not too sure. Well, I, I, I gotta really be careful what I'm saying because at the end of the day, I think I, I am picking C-Rod, but the breakdown's not gonna be simple. I think at this point here, we have two guys who have incredible cardio, incredible durability, incredible striking, who's gonna have the advantage? And I think that the truth is, Simon may have the hand speed advantage. And, and I do think that he is a very good striker, has a good ability to mix it up. And I do think he's got power in his own right. This is by no means an easy fight to pick, but I, I think when we look at it from a broader perspective, I, I like the mentality of Rodriguez. I mean, he's a dog, very serious about what he does. He has multiple ways to get it done too, right? Ability to mix it up on the ground. I think he has more volume as well. And I think he starts the fight quicker. And that's kind of where my breakdown is coming down to is I watch all these fights of Simon, and although he's super fun to watch, terrific striking, good ability with takedown defense as well, He's slow to get started. I mean, contender series, he was, I think he lost that first round, if I'm not mistaken. Against Kozlo, allowed Kozlo to have success as well. And I think that him potentially dropping this first round to Rodriguez could be detrimental to him. So yeah, with the right game plan, I think Simon has the skill set to go out there and beat Rodriguez, but not with too much confidence. I instead think Rodriguez has the better overall tools to rely on, better grappling path to victory, better volume, better work rate to start. And he is someone I'm gonna to wanna to back here. At 8.4K on DraftKings, I don't know how well he'll score in a win because I do think there's gonna be a 15 minute kickboxing affair, maybe one or two takedowns from Rodriguez. But either way, it's gonna be a fun one. It's probably got split decision written all over it, especially considering how much the judges love. I guess not judges, but I guess how much the UFC loves Simon and that South African crew. So. It, it, I don't even know if I get to the betting window, but if I had to sit here and give you a pick, my lean would be towards Rodriguez. This is not the fight I'm the most interested in on DraftKings because I do think, like I said, it's a 15-minute kickboxing affair, but I think it's be fun. I wouldn't mind putting my feet up watching this one. Two young prospects going at it. I'm going to pick C-Rod, but a very, very close one. Not too much conviction. Best of luck to whatever you play. Oh, here we go. 10 and 5 Edgar Chares, 11 and 5 Daniel Lacerda at 1.30 this time and shorter breakdown because we're breaking down this fight. Uh, it's supposed to happen already. Did happen already, actually. They went out there, uh, ended in no contest because of the early stoppage. Either way, it happened like every Lacerda fight, right? Almost. Lacerda is typically a guy who likes to go out there, balls to the wall, 
uh, incredible grappling, incredible kickbox, incredible power, but he's just like McKinney. He fades after five minutes. And in this one, he kind of took a slower approach, but you could see he was fading, right? Went for a takedown approach, he kind of got slower, and Charles capitalized. And I think this match appears the same as all of them have been before. With certain someone who fights for five minutes, he could be a champion, man. I don't know, maybe a bit of an exaggeration, but I think he's very technically sound. I think he's got a good ground game as well, decent wrestling. And his fundamentals in the striking and his variety of strikes can lead him towards winning a lot of fights. But if he can't get that first round finish, he fades on the stretch. He's 0-4 inside the UFC, losing to Vergara in round two, Ultimate Reno and Figgy in round one, and Molina in round two. And then fights versus Vergara and Molina, who won round one against and then failed down the stretch. So to me, he's not someone you can trust. He's facing someone in Chires, better striker, much better cardio. And, that, and that's kind of what matters here. So this fight's going to stay the same. Chires being a Mexican brawler, it's so hard for Lacerda to get him out of there. And for that reason, Charles is the pick because he's gonna have the ability to wear down Lacerda, get a later finish and take over as this fight goes on. But Lacerda's path to victory as always is a first round KO, first round submission. And I don't think it's impossible to happen. Just not something to rely on too much. For that reason on DraftKings, give me Lacerda, 7K. Somebody can go out there and path to victory scores very, very well, but I can't pick him with good conscience here. Uh, although he's probably the better technical fighter, cardio is not there, durability is not there. We haven't really seen his heart be in there too much. And Chires is the opposite. Chires got great cardio, great ability to win these fights on the stretch. I do think he takes over as the fight goes on. For that reason, I do think Chires is very live at 9.2K. He was en route to a first round 95 point submission last time, so could happen again. Either way, with a fight projection inside the distance so often, you wanna to look towards this one, should be fun. And then another short notice one, 28-11 Michelle Pereira, moving up to 185 to face Andre Petrovsky. Pereira, a guy who I've been pretty high on, Petrovsky, a guy I've been pretty low on, and another fight that I've been going back and forth on all week. I always said if Pereira fought the best of abilities, he could be a lot better than he is, right? Because he's a reckless guy who likes to entertain people. And he's a great entertainer, but you want to see him go out there and fight to the best of his abilities. And he's kind of been doing that recently. Five wins in a row. I mean, he's looked decent doing so. All, all decisions. Five wins in a row, all power to him, but he's fun, man. Super explosive. Backflips along the cage. Superman punches and kicks and whatever he does, but he's fine this ability to win minutes, right? good in and out striking, good ability to mix up the takedowns whenever he needs to. Decent volume and good optics. He's an entertainer, a guy who can win these optics a lot of the time. But moving up to 185, we're gonna see how it really affects him because Petrovsky is a guy who's gonna go out there and test that. Petrovsky is someone who I'm not very high on, but there's no debate that he's got skills. I mean, the reason I was so hard on him was because he's always been a big favorite and now he's an underdog for, I think, the first time. Sorry, he was a big underdog against Maximoff. Different stylistic matchup, didn't even clue into it. But Petrovsky's biggest red flag has always been that cardio, right? We saw it happen on uh, the Ultimate Fighter house. We've seen him slow down in fights, even against Mearshart. And because he's not the best striker on the feet and a guy who relies solely on grappling, as that gas tank fades, so does he, man. And he's gonna be a guy who, if he doesn't get that early finish in a lot of these fights where his opponents make him work, he's hard to trust on the stretch. Because I think, yeah, in the striking, it's gonna be Pereira, but this is the fight at 185. Petrovsky is the natural 185-er, and he is someone who could have the ability to, to hold him down down the stretch. The problem I have here is the short notice nature. Petrovsky's cardio is already red flag. How can I trust him to go out there, control prayer for 15 minutes? And, and I can't really expect him to do so. For that reason, I'm gonna have to side with Pereira here due to his minute winning ability. With that being said though, th this fight can play in a multitude of ways. Pereira is tough, and he himself is not the best cardio in his own right, but maybe it's better at 185. He should be winning the striking exchanges, good in and out movement, good volume, good diversity in his attacks. And it's gonna be Petrovsky shooting takedowns. Can Pereira stuff them? Can Pereira get back up? Can Pereira make him work to go out there and attack some Petrovsky casting on short notice? That's my thought process. And that's the reason I'm kind of picking Pereira to really win these optics as the fight goes on. But with that being said, on DraftKings, there's only one fighter I want here, it's Andre Petrovsky. A 7.6K, he's the underdog with a grappling path to victory who averages 100 points in his wins. Although I think Pereira has some viability to go out there and win this fight, it's a striking based exchange, one where He's never scored above 100 points in a decision. In his last four fights, he scored 74, 80, 91, 62. Not something you want to see from someone, especially with a striking-based background, right? So it's going to be the grappling of Petrovsky. His path to victory is going to score very, very well. And for that reason, he's an underdog I want to target. With that being said, though, from a pick perspective, I got to go with Pereira having this fight circled on his calendar, having the better striking of the two, and being the more battle-tested guy. A few more left here. 18 and 4, Jonathan Martinez. 16 and 4, Adrian Yanez. Tough one. Two phenomenal strikers. Uh, this is going to be a 15 minute kickboxing affair. And one where we have a guy, two guys lying, minus 110, minus 110, and you tend to agree with it. Drafting is wise, I do have Giannis as the slight favorite. And spoiler alert, that's where my pick's going to go as well. If I had to line this fight, I'd go minus 120 plus 100. And that's really what it is. That's how close this fight is. And really, this breakdown comes down to, to one thing in particular, and, and that's kind of the durability. And let me get into it. First of all, Jonathan Martinez on a good streak. Questionable win against Ramagamedo, but uh, Swanson, Morales, Perez, everybody since uh, losing to Grant being knocked out there, he's done very, very well against, and he shows that technicality. Great leg kicks, great one-two over the top, 
good composure, right? He likes to slow down these fights, pick people apart from range. He has a good ability to do so. Giannis has been the opposite, right? Hype train, knocking out and flipping off Khalif, knocking out Costa, knocking out Lopez, knocking out Rodriguez, war with Davy Grant that he was able to win here, and then falling to Rob Font in that last one. And it, that was like a too much, too soon kind of situation. He got too ahead of himself. But he's been a hype train, right? Someone who's been exciting to watch. And Martinez has been kind of overlooked. So we're finally getting two guys who are going to go out there, stand and bang, give each other the fights they want. And it's fun to go out there and see what they're going to do. I think if this fight plays out from range, 15 minutes, Martinez may have the edge. And that's why I land this fight so close. Better, I think, technically with the kicks in terms of slowing the fight down, fighting at his pace and winning optics that way. But Martinez has been bonked before. He's been caught. And not only do I like the accuracy and the power of Yanez, is I can trust him to go out there and fight a brawl and win it more often. And for that reason, he's someone who I just want to back in this spot here, but not with too much conviction. I mean, Martinez also has the better striking defense of the two, which is why this fight is so close. But if I had to pick one, I would say lean towards the power and let's say trustworthiness of Giannis. Drafting wise where things get questionable because in Giannis's one decision win in the UFC, he only scored 70 points. And in Martinez's decision wins, he scored anywhere from 64, 78, 59, 67, 59. Both these guys aren't the best scorers from a drafting perspective in decision wins. And expecting this to be a 15 minute kickboxing affair, I can't really get to him too often. I actually lean towards Giannis on draftings because I said he has knockout upside to the chin of Martinez, making it one where you could be a bit different in that regard. But with so many good close fights here, GVP perspective, I, I would lean towards a different fight here. I might as well sit back. Same thing as Rodriguez Simon one, where I sit back, put my feet up, enjoy some incredible matchmaking and uh, see what happens here. But I am gonna slightly lean towards Giannis. Very, very fun fight, but I just think he's someone I can trust more considering the durability edge of Martinez. But a Martinez decision due to his superior defense and, and strike from the outside wouldn't surprise me at all. All right, I've been talking a bunch, so let's see if I can make this one a quicker one here. 21, nine and one, Jennifer Maya, 11 and five, Viviana Rujo. Uh, not to say I don't have too much interest in the co event, but not one I want to play too much of on DraftKings and not one that I have the strongest read on either. With that being said, I do think the right fighter here is favored. I mean, Jennifer Maya has shown a good ability to go out there, mixing her striking very well and at a very good rate. And being someone who has such a good jujitsu game uh, to mix in the strike as well as she does, she's someone who has been you know what? Impressive, to say the least. I mean, I'm a big Casey O'Neill fan, and she she did well against her. And that's kind of where I think she has the edge here, is that volume, is the ability to mix it up on the ground as well, because although she's winning these fights in the feet, she has submission wins. She has a black belt down there. She has the ability to dominate these fights if they ever go there, but she just doesn't decide to that much often because she doesn't need to. Rougeau is also someone I like as well. I mean, someone who has good physicality, good power in her shots as well, but... In her last one, where she was out volume by Reboss, uh, where she didn't really have the ability to mix in any takedowns either, losing the eye to Kagi in it, and winning only against this questionable level of competition really is, I don't really know if she's the best realistic matchup here. Arujo has a ton of power, good moment winning ability, uh, good physicality as well, but she doesn't win minutes all too often. When someone as good as Maya is gonna be throwing as much volume, as much output, be such a threat in the ground towards Arujo, test that gas tank, I think Maya is somebody you can trust more, and I think Maya's gonna be the one walking away with her hand raised at the end of the day. She's a better cardio, better output. I, I do like her here at, at a decently high clip, but not a fight I want too much on DraftKings. Neither of these fighters scored too well. I guess in Maya's last decision win, she scored 91, but typically she scores around that 78 mark, 70 mark, 74 against Monteferi. Really not the highest tracking score. And considering how durable she's been, how good she's able to go out there and compete, uh, I don't see Arujo fulfilling her major path to victory, which is moment winning and finish ability where when she's able to do that, she's able to score well. But to me, not a fight I want too much exposure to. Give me Maya to win this one though. Volume, but um, we'll have to see where it is. And then the main event, 13 and two, Sadiq Yusuf, 23 and 11, Edson Barbosa. What a main event. I mean, it's kind of going under the radar, kind of getting a bit of, you know, backlash, but I love it, man. You have a guy in Edson Barbosa who is just an incredible striker. Like one of the best strikers we've seen, a ton of knockout power and really find anybody's off switch anytime. Just ask Billy Q, someone I'm really high on versus Sadiq Youssef. I mean, six and one of the UFC only lost to Arnold Allen, put together one of the greatest Dana White series of all time, put together one of the greatest Dana White contender series fights of all time. Check that out if you haven't. But someone who's also been very fun to watch and someone who has a good ability to mix it up. And I think in this matchup here, we have a good clash of styles, right? Barbosa is that sniper. He's getting older in age, but he is a terrific, terrific range finder. A ton of power in his hands to put anybody's lights out. And when he gets his read in the feet, can be a true problem. When he's going out there and he's able to tee off on his opponents, he's almost unstoppable, right? When no one's putting up too much resistance, like a Shane Burgos, like a Dan Hooker, he can go out there and he can win these fights at extremely high pace because he, he is so accurate on the feet and he is just a, a sniper up there. But when people are putting on adversity against him, right? When people are in his face, taking away his range, making him question his willingness to be in there. I mean, he didn't look that good against Mitchell at all. Gaethje got in his way and knocked him out. I mean, different fighters have had the ability to go out there and pressure him and, and, and make him question his ability to be in there. And at this point of his career, when he's getting older and all this stuff, 
it makes it for a very interesting matchup. Because I think that stylistically, the better striker to choose Barbosa. But at this career trajectory, with uh, the ability to mix it up not only the feet and the ground, with the hand speed, the physicality of Yusuf, Yusuf's going to be a problem here. And I do believe him to be the favorite, the rightful favorite in this matchup. Sorry. I like Yusuf. I think he can win minutes here. They can utilize takedowns. I think he can get in Barbosa's face and cause problems for that regard. And for that reason, I do like him over 25 minutes. I love his cardio, love his work rate. He's someone fun to watch. But the question is, is that durability, right? Not even that durability, because no one really tests him. He, he's looked good so far, but knocked out against Allen. And I think in that one real step of a competition, that one real test, although he was winning minutes, although he was going out there and, and winning the judges' scorecards, Barbosa's got that sniper-like mentality that can knock anybody's lights out. And for that reason, that's only the reason I'm lacking confidence in Yusuf, right? I think Yusuf can win the minutes, win the grappling exchanges, win the volume, win the pressure, win the, win the minutes and optics, right? But it's that one KO shot. The same one that Barbosa landed on Burgos, right? These are these scary knockouts that can put out anybody's lights. And I think that Yusuf is, is not invincible. Let's just put it that way. So the pick is Yusuf. I didn't think it's it done. On DraftKings, he's the side I want as well. But I want this fight from both sides, right? Over 25 minutes, Yusuf's ability to break him down the stretch, good pace, good volume, good minute-winning ability. He's going to score well at 8.7K. Whereas the path to victory, like I said for Barbosa, is that one-shot knockout power. And we learned last week with uh, Bobby Green, anybody can find that knockout punch. And then go out there, score optimal. And I do think Barbosa has the power, unlike anybody, to go out there and, and win this fight. So give me Yusuf. Hedge on Barbosa, considering that I'm going to have some exposure to him on DraftKings with that knockout upside, but a very, very fun main event. That's going to do it for me here on the Plays and Fades YouTube channel. Let me quickly run through my quick picks. Taking Sadiq Yusuf, taking Jennifer Maya, Adrian Yanez, Michelle Pereira, Edgar Chares, Christian Rodriguez, Darren Elkins, Tanera Lisboa, Terrence McKinney. I'm going to say Melissa Dixon, but a low-level fight there. Chris Gutierrez has gone to my head, but values on Alatang Haley and then Emily Ducote. DraftKings-wise, of course you love that mckinney Marot fight and the Charles the Certified fight. Both those fights expect to end early. GBP upside on all four of those fighters, but mostly McKinney and Charles. Some other sneaky fights to target are the main event, Yusuf Barbosa, TJ Brown versus Darren Elkins, and Dixon versus Alex Seva. Lisboa Oliveira, also very sneaky considering the, the high work rate, high finish upside, but sloppier fights are harder to trust. As underdogs I like, I like Petrovsky. I like Alex Seva for GPP. I like Elkins. I like Alatang Haley. There's some fun drafting slates in this card. Rainmakers wise, I think the highest ceilings out of everybody are McKinney, Lisboa, Shirez, Youssef, and funny enough, the winner of Dixon and Alexeva because I do think it ends inside the distance. Betting wise, nothing has been locked in so far, but I will be betting the under in the Dixon and Alexeva fight. I will be betting Alateng Hey Lee, especially if this line continues to climb. Maybe Darren Elkins. I don't know if I can get their trust in the damage, but we'll see where my bets will end up. Check me out on Twitter at Gamble's Gordo for my full slate of bets. But once again, that's going to do it for me here on the Plays and Fades YouTube channel. Hopefully, you guys have picked up enough knowledge that I've been putting down over the course of me blabbering for the past, whatever, 30 minutes this has been. Make sure to hit the like button down below, subscribe to the channel, show some love, check out my best bets video out later this week, and enjoy the card. UFC Vegas 81, wish everyone all the best of luck in their betting endeavors. Let's make some money, guys.